Good morning to all of you. This morning we continue on in, we continue on in our series in which we have entitled Major Lessons from the Minor Prophets. And if you haven't been with us uh, the past few weeks, Pastor Randy has already led us through the books of Hosea and Obadiah. And you can watch those on our YouTube channel if you haven't done so already. Uh, but this morning, we're going to be spending our time in the book of Joel. And we're really going to be focusing in on that last chapter of the book of Joel, Joel chapter 3. But really briefly, I think it's important that we first understand what has happened thus far in Joel chapter 1 and, and Joel chapter 2. So to provide just a little bit of context of what's gone on thus far in Joel, in, in Joel chapter 1, he writes um, of this recent disaster that has taken place. Okay, there's, the, there's been this swarm of locusts. There were locusts everywhere, and they devastated the land. And this description of this swarm of locusts, it would have recalled the day of the Lord uh, on Egypt, if you remember back to the eighth plague in the book of Exodus. This plague of locusts upon Egypt, but this time the, the, the locusts are against Israel. So Joel calls the, the, the elders and the priests to lead them in this time of prayer and repentance, turning from their sin. And then in Joel chapter 2, it shifts from this, this past threat to a, a future threat. There's this impending doom that is coming upon them. And there's all this military imagery to again imply that God's judgment is coming for a sin that is not explicitly mentioned in this book, though uh, in my studies, there seems to be this belief that uh, the, God's people have become prosperous, but complacent, turning to self-centeredness and idol worship, perhaps a little bit of a look in the mirror. But again, God gives them an opportunity to repent and, and turn from their sinful ways, and in response, God answers them with this promise of restoring their land and restoring His presence among them, which brings us to Joel chapter 3. Again, our text for this morning, where we're going to again see this idea of God's judgment, but His deliverance, but ultimately pointing to that ultimate, that final, that future day of the Lord. So as we work through Joel chapter 3 this morning, know the immediate context of what's going on is God's people. They're in this region called Judah. And they're waiting for this day where God is going to come and He is going to defeat their enemies. He's going to judge them. And God's people would be delivered and restored. But what I'm going to seek to do this morning for us as we go through Joel 3 is point and show how it points to this ultimate, again, future final day of the Lord. The day in which we long for. Because we recognize the brokenness that is in our world. We recognize the hurt and the pain and the agony that we experience. The suffering, the division, the hatred, and probably only, only some of it. This world is full of suffering that I think we are oblivious to. But there's hope. We have hope. And that's what we're going to get to this morning. But first, I have two takeaways, only two takeaways this morning for you as we work through the two large chunks of Scripture from Joel 3, as we look to the future and final day of the Lord. And the first takeaway is this, is that God will bring His judgment. God will bring judgment. Follow me as we read Joel chapter 3, verses 1 to 16. It says this, In those days... And at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. There I will put them on trial for what they did to my inheritance. My people Israel, because they scattered my people among the nations and divided up my land. They cast lots for my people, traded boys for prostitutes, and sold girls for wine to drink. Now what have you against me, Tyra and Sidon, and all your regions of Philistia? Are you repaying me for something I have done? If you're repaying me back, I will swiftly and speedily return on your own heads what you have done. For you took my silver and my gold, and you carried it off my finest treasures to your temples. You sold the people of Judah and Jerusalem to the Greeks, that you might send them far from their homeland. See, I am going to rouse them out of the places to which you sold them, 
and I will return on your own heads what you have done. I will sell your sons and your daughters to the people of Judah, and I will sell them to the Sabians, a nation far away. The Lord has spoken. Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for war. Rouse the warriors. Let all the fighting men draw near and attack. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weaklings say, I am strong. Come quickly, all you nations from every side, and assemble there. Bring down your warriors, Lord. Let the nations be roused. Let them advance into the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge all the nations on every side. Swing the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, trample the grapes, for the winepress is full, and the vats overflow, so great is their wickedness. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and moon will be darkened, and the stars will no longer shine. The Lord will roar from Zion and thunder from Jerusalem. The earth and the heavens will tremble. But the Lord will be a refuge for his people, a stronghold for the people of Israel. A long chunk of text. So let's work through it. Okay, it starts by saying that God is going to bring together all of the surrounding nations of Judah, all the enemy nations of Judah. He is going to bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat, which in Hebrew means God has judged. God judges, and He's going to do exactly that. He is going to judge the enemies of Judah. But for what? Well, the text tells us that they've taken the land. They have divided the land. They have divided God's people. They've enslaved. They've, they've traded off. They have sold God's people and even the youngest of those for, for wealth and personal pleasures. They've stolen from God's temple, plundering His temple, taking the, the silver and the gold and the finest treasures and, and bringing it back to their own temples for their own idol worship. It's hard to fathom that this level of evil would exist. But this level of evil exists in our world today. And I think it's a lot closer to home than we even know. Fighting over land, human trafficking, slavery, the destruction of God's churches, it makes God very angry. And it ought to make us very angry as well. And God tells us in Joel chapter 3 here that He, he promises to repay them for the evil that they have committed. He will repay them for the evil that they committed. So jumping to verse 9, we see God, He's pretty well taunting the enemies. Calling them to battle. Come. Come on down. Bring your swords. Bring your spears. You think you're strong. You're weak. Come on. Bring it. But we know God can't lose. He's God. He's going to win, but He's taunting them. He, he's egging them on. And then we shift from this war, this, this battle imagery, to this image of, of a courtroom in verse 12 where God says He is the judge and He's going to sit and He is going to judge them. And He has every piece of evidence that He needs. He is God. He sees everything. He knows everything. He has every last piece of evidence that He needs to execute His righteous judgment and He finds them guilty. They're guilty. And then we shift from this, again, the, the, the battle imagery to this courtroom image to this final metaphor of a harvest. In verse 13, where it says, Swing the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, trample the, the grapes, for the wine press is full. Meaning, that's it. That's it. Once the, the sickle goes through, once the crops are harvested, once the, the grapes are crushed into wine, that's it. The final judgment is done. It will be executed. And then we laser in on verse 16. It's this terrifying verse that says, the Lord will roar from Zion. I can't even begin to imagine the terror of hearing the roar of the Lord. And to think that the roar of the Lord is being directed at you and not in protection of you is terrifying language. And this roar of the Lord is going to have cosmic consequences. It's going to affect the whole world. It says the heavens and the earth, they'll quake the whole world is going to tremble. 
But at the end of of verse 16, again, there's this shift. It says, but the Lord will be a refuge to his people, be a stronghold for the people of Israel. I picture it almost being like one of them underground bunkers. Right? Explosions are going off. It's pure chaos. But underneath, their refuge is safe and secure. So though God's judgment, it does has, have cosmic consequences for the entire world. God's people, God's chosen people, will be safe and secure in and through Him. So again, the immediate context of what's going on here in Joel is the surrounding enemy nations that, have, that are wicked and evil. They will be judged harshly. But Judah will be saved. But ultimately what this points to is in the New Testament, this final day of judgment where there is going to be a divide. But it's not going to be divided between uh, those who have done good and those who have done bad. It's not going to be divided by if you're black or white or Democrat or Republican or if you cheer for Michigan or Michigan State or even Ohio State. It'll be divided between those who are in Christ and those who are outside of Christ. Those who are outside of Christ will be judged but those who are in Christ will be saved. So where is your faith this morning? We have all fallen short of the glory of God. Scripture tells us that. You, I, none of us are remotely close to being perfect. But do you recognize your need for a Savior? Or do you believe in the false hope that somehow, some way, you're going to be able to save yourself? because you can't. And do you love God and do you love your neighbor enough to share uh, their need uh, for Jesus to be their Savior? And not in some Pharisaic way where we're we're judging them, we're casting judgment upon people, but in a Christ-like way where we speak the truth in love and we present the gospel in a way where it comes across as the good news that it actually is. There will be those who are in Christ and there will be those who are not and the Lord will rule against them. Is it absolutely terrifying? Yes, it is. But is it unfair? Absolutely not. Okay, it's hard for us to fathom. It's hard for us to understand, but God is perfect in all of His ways and while we as human beings are limited in our own understanding, He is not. It is His good and it is perfect plan that is being worked out for His people and His creation. So again, I ask you the question, what is your refuge in today? What is the shelter for your soul? What do you put your hope in? Is it in your church attendance? Is it in just how nice you treat other people? Is it in how many hours you serve or how many hours you work? Is it in how much you give? Is it in your job? Is it in your relationships, your accolades, your wealth? Is it in your good deeds? But here's the simple truth of the Gospel. The simple truth of what we believe as Christ followers is that, is that there is no other refuge that can save you apart from Jesus Christ. It is He, and it is He alone. Meaning on that final day of judgment, there will not be an ounce of God's wrath that is against you if you are in Christ, because that is what Christ took upon Himself in your and my place on that cross. So that we would have the full affection and relationship with God. He takes the judgment of our sin upon Himself. It's the simple yet powerful life-transforming news of the Gospel that one day, on that day, we are secured. On that day, you can be assured. On that day, you don't have to wonder. There's no right now that I need to do this, I need to do that, I need to get my life in order, I need to get my habits down pat. Though those are good things to do, we do not depend on the righteousness of ourselves. But again, we depend on the righteousness of Jesus, of Christ and Christ alone. That is the first takeaway. God on that day will bring judgment on the world, but those who are in Christ, those who put their faith in Him and what He has done for you again on that cross, 
will be saved. Praise God. The second takeaway that I have for you this morning is this. On that day, the future day of the Lord, God will bring full restoration. Verses 17 to 21 says, Then you will know that I, the Lord your God, dwell in Zion, my holy hill. Jerusalem will be holy. Never again will foreigners invade her. In that day the mountains will drip new wine and the hills will flow with milk. All the ravines of Judah will run with water. A fountain will flow out of the Lord's house and will water the valley of Acacias. But Egypt will be desolate. Edom, a desert waste. Because of violence done to the people of Judah, in whose land they shed innocent blood. Judah will be inhabited forever and Jerusalem through all generations. Shall I leave their innocent blood unavenged? No, I will not. The Lord dwells in Zion. It's the end of the book of Joel. So in the midst of all the terrifying judgment that's going to take place, we said God is a refuge for His people. But not only does He show great mercy for His people by not destroying them, He also shows much grace by promising an abundant future in a restored land. In Joel, it talks about Judah being restored and and we see the mountains that are dripping with wine and the hills that are flowing with milk and and, and, and then there's going to be this river that flows from the house of the Lord and it's going to water the whole valley. It's a place to be inhabited forever as God dwells in their midst. You see, our salvation isn't just precious to us because of what we are saved from. It is also precious to us because of what we are saved to. Here we read about this glorious restoration of Judah. But one day we will see it ultimately fulfilled in the age to come when God comes to bring about the new heaven and the new earth like we read about in the final book of the Bible, Revelation. It's this beautiful conclusion of God's story. It's His grand narrative that's being played out and it all comes to an end in Revelation 21. I'd like to read a couple verses if you don't mind. Starting in verse 1, it says, Then I saw... A new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and He will dwell with them. They will be His people, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. So what we read about in our text in in Joel about this glorious future of Judah is ultimately pointing us to this ultimate future day of the Lord a new heaven, a new earth, a holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven and God will be with His people forever. It says He's going to wipe every tear. There's going to be no more death. There's going to be no more pain. There's going to be no more mourning. He makes all things new. It's our ultimate. It's our final. It's our eternal destination. Heaven and earth being brought together in union finally and fully. Now this restoration of Judah is just a picture of what God is going to do with his entire world. And I'd like to explore some cool links between Joel and Revelation, and we'll look at a couple of the implications of them. I have four of them. Things that we have to look forward to in the new creation. We'll go through them pretty quickly, but the first is this, is God's protection. God's protection, Joel chapter 3, verse 17 says, Never again will foreigners invade her. Revelation 21, 27 says, Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. You see the link here. Joel isn't talking about some ethnic purity where no other nation is going to be able to enter in. What Joel is talking about is no one will ever come in again for conquest. 
No one is ever going to come in and try and take us over. And that is exactly true about what is promised to us in the new Jerusalem and the new creation. You guys ever have a hard time relaxing? Like everything in life seems to be going good, but for whatever reason we have this anticipation that something is going to go bad or something is going to go wrong so we can't relax. I feel that way a lot. Especially when I'm with the youth group. (laughs) (laughs) Youth group is great, I tell you. But good grief, we could have a good old meal one day and we could... We could be worshiping together, have a good old conversation. But you never know when a soccer ball is going to be kicked at you from Caitlin or Buddy's going to take a dodgeball and whip it at your head or Kenzie's going to grab the spike ball and whip it at your gut or Zach's going to peer pressure you to go on some roller coaster that's way too big. It's hard to relax around these kids. So fun. But on a more serious note, you know the feeling. Everything in life seems to be going well, but instead of being able to relax and enjoy the blessings of God, we worry. We sit and we worry. We worry about things like finances or our jobs or our relationships. Maybe you worry about your kids. We worry about the things that are around us. Politics, wars, rumors of wars. There's many things that we worry about. But that will not be the case in the new creation. Nothing impure will ever enter it. There will be nothing external that could come in and ruin everything. And not only will there be nothing external that could come in and ruin it, there will be nothing internal that could ruin it. As we will have these resurrected bodies as Christ did, and there will be no more sin, there will be no more suffering, there will be no more temptations or struggling with the flesh. It will be perfect. And it will be peaceful. God protects it. Amen. Amen. The second link that I have for us, thing that we have to look forward to in the new creation is the promise of God's abundance. Joel chapter 3 says, In that day the mountains will drip new wine, and the hills will flow with milk, and all the ravines of Judah will run with water. And then in Revelation it says, The walls will be made of jasper, and the city of pure gold as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. Think about the context of what's going on. In Joel, their land was just devastated by locusts. And then there's this promise of this supernatural recreation of their land. And the imagery of what we're given in Revelation is it says the city is going to be made up of gold and precious stones and walls of jasper. You know, I don't know how many of you guys, probably not any of you, but watched the coronation of King Charles III in England. I don't know how long ago that was. But it was in Canada. It was broadcasted everywhere. And I remember sitting there and and watching and thinking, for one, this is ridiculous, Um, but two, sitting there in awe. The carriage was pure gold. The crown, gold, and jewels decorated everything. It was extravagant. It was beautiful. But it's minuscule compared to what is to come. Walls made up of jasper. Cities made up of gold as pure as glass, decorated with the finest jewels. It's crazy to think about. It's unfathomable. We spend so much time on this earth trying to accumulate this form of wealth, and it takes our eyes off of the Lord. When God says, if you would just keep your eyes on eternal things, this is what I promise you. We will have everything we need and unimaginably more. Good grief. I just want them to fix that one pothole on 28th Street. I seem to hit it every time. But you're telling me that the things that we find so valuable on this side of heaven, the gold, the jewels, the jasper, it's going to line our streets? Man. The third link is the river from God. The river from God meeting satisfaction. Joel 3 says, A fountain will flow out of the Lord's house and will water the valley of Acacias. Revelation 22, verse 1 to 2 says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb down the middle of the great city 
uh, of the great street of the city. So a river that comes from God that brings satisfaction to the land around it that was once parched in Joel. Now there is beautiful water. There is satisfaction that is coming. I love this picture of a river. Of water because I think of good grief. Even when we come for worship, how many of us think that we need to bring our buckets of water and it's like, okay, here, God, here's, my, here's my, my Bible reading for the week. Here's my church attendance for the week. Here's my giving for the week. When, we, when actually, when we come to worship, we worship God by coming to his river, and we drink, we drink deeply. We say, God, I'm parched. God, I'm thirsty. I'm going to come to your river, and I'm going to drink from your water. God is glorified in that. He is not glorified in us thinking that we have some impressive offering to bring. So when we come to worship, we come to worship Him who is the source of our satisfaction. Our hearts were made to find fulfillment. It's life, it's joy in Jesus Christ and Him alone. So when we have gone to other things to find fulfillment and it still leaves us feeling empty, that is your heart crying out for something that can only be fulfilled in Jesus. In the new creation, we will worship Him forever and we will be satisfied. And the final link that we have to look forward to between Joel and Revelation is God's presence. Joel says, Then you will know that I, the Lord your God, dwell in Zion, my holy hill. Revelation 21, verse 3 says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and He will dwell with them forever. They will, they will be His people, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. So when Joel, at the beginning and the end of this, this last section of, of Joel, we see this promise of God's presence. He will dwell in Zion. He will dwell with His people that is what this whole thing is about. That is the basis of our eternal joy in the age to come, that Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, will be there. I remember being asked a couple years ago this question, you know, imagine you're in the new creation and, and you have everything you want, everything you need and more, but Jesus isn't there. Would you be satisfied? Would you want it? And if you answer yes to that question, you have missed the treasure of the gospel. Because the treasure of the gospel is Jesus Christ himself. The God who blesses us. The God who, who gives abundant blessings. These blessings ultimately should be pointing us back to him. For Jesus Christ is our refuge. Jesus Christ is our hope. He is the abundant one who we go to for life and satisfaction. And one day, on that future day of the Lord, where He will come back to judge His creation, those who are in Christ will be saved. And we will dwell in His presence forever. Praise God, who is our hope. Let's pray. Father, Again, we thank you for your word that you have for us this morning, and we're thankful for how you speak, how you spoke through the prophets and how you speak to us today. Lord, we long for the day where you're going to come again, because again, we do recognize the brokenness and the hurt in this world, the, the hurt and the, the brokenness and the suffering that we experience, but only knowing that that's only a part of it, Lord, that there is so much suffering that goes on in this world that we are so oblivious to. There is so much evil. But you promise to repay the evil. You promise that you're coming back, Lord, and you're going to judge. But we cling to the hope that we have that is in you. We thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who took our place on the cross so that our relationship with you could be restored and we could have this promise of eternal life where we will dwell in your perfect presence forever. There will be peace and it will be perfect. Lord, we can't wait for that day. But be with us as we wait. Help us to do your will as we wait, serving those who are around us, proclaiming the good news of the gospel to all of those that you would put before us. Lord, it is by your grace 
that we are able to do that by your Holy Spirit, Lord. We thank you and we love you again for your word and how you are with us here this morning. It's in Jesus' mighty name that we pray. Amen.